Test it. But this is, okay, there we go. Uh, we don't have, there's no little format, not going to be no A and B selection and all that. We get right to it. As Christopher Darden said, we're going to cut to the chase. Uh, it gives me great pleasure, great honor uh, to have with us for the next two days, Dr. William Blunt, <coughs> he's the pastor of the Greater Young Zion Baptist Church in Augusta, Georgia. I uh, first uh, met him at NET about three years ago, I believe it was, and he poured out his life and just literally just blew me away. And uh, the next year, Donna went, blew her away. And uh, <coughs> we just were blessed uh, by his teaching. And uh, I, uh, I was talking to him at the time, I was associated and said, I was talking to Pastor Ryan about the possibility of bringing him here. And so when I said, Dr. Ryan, Pastor Ryan wants to know what, what kind of fee, what it would cost. He says, I'll do that. You just call me and I'll come. And here he is. Amen. He was in demand all over the country. And we were able to get two days. Amen. And then we were talking with his um, assistant. We were looking at the calendar and all that, and there were some days in October, so I'll take them. You know, like, like uh, Hawaii 5 0, book them. <laughs> so without any further ado, Dr. William Blunt, pastor of the Greater Young Zion Baptist Church of Augusta, Georgia. Amen. 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 Depending on the foundation, 
made that so mess. Yes. So we look at foundational institutions that God created. The first institution he created was the home. Amen? And he moved from the home, from the government to the church. So you got the home, the government, and the church. So what's first? Foundation. The home. And the enemy is good because the enemy don't care how many churches y'all got in, in Richmond. I don't know about you, people ain't going to hell in Augusta because there's a lack of churches. We got churches on every block, every corner. We got churches they even call churches. Amen. Amen. But the issue is the enemy is attacking the home. He's attacking the home. Family is so important to God. Let me tell you why family is so important to God. And when you look at the divine family, there are three components of the divine family. You got a father, you got a son, and you got a Holy Ghost. There are three components of the earthly family. You got a man, you got a woman, and you got children. So what did God do? Listen, in the divine family, the son came from the father. In the earthly family, the woman came from the man. In the divine family, the father and son are one. In the earthly family, the man and woman get married, and they become one. In the divine family, the Holy Ghost represents the father and the son. In the earthly family, the children come from the mother and the father. In the divine family, all three make one family. In, the, in one God, in the earthly family, all three make one family. So when God put a family on earth, he put a family on earth to model what it's like in heaven. All right. Everybody in here was born with an earthly family. You were born into an earthly family. Amen? Amen. When you get born again, you go right back into family relationship. For the Bible said, as many as received him, they become the sons of God. Amen? Now, everybody can call him God, but everybody can't call him daddy. You've got to be in the family to be able to do that. Amen? And so that's why Jesus said, when you pray, remember your relationship. When you pray, say, our Father. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Guess what? You join the church, you're right back in a family relationship because everybody in the church are brothers and sisters. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. If you get saved, you're right back in a family relationship because Jesus is the bridegroom and we are the bride and we're waiting to get married when we get to heaven. When we get to heaven, we're going to live in daddy's house. We're going to get in daddy's house. We're going to live in a family relationship for the rest of your life. So you got to understand how important family is to God. It's a very important thing. And it's the one thing that we don't do well. The enemy attacks the home. Everything is a product of the home. You know why? Because the real you is at your house. Everything outside of your house is your image. Everything outside of your house is projected. It's projected, amen? It's projected. When you go, when you listen, when you go to work, they don't meet the real you. They meet your work personality. When you leave home, you don't really look like that. Your skin ain't that clear. Amen. Many times your hair ain't that low. Amen. And guess what? You smiling with somebody wearing your teeth. Yeah, when the real you is inside your house. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. And so therefore, we need to understand that we have institutionalized our faith, and that's a big mistake because we've institutionalized our faith. We, we are measuring our spiritual effectiveness or our spiritual barometer of what happened at an institution. But that, that, this is not what God wants us to be because, let me tell you something, everybody in here is projected. Because you really ain't there holy. But you, you, you put, you, you project that. It's like, let me tell you something. Pastor Blunt is not who I am. Pastor Blunt is what I do. Right. See, my wife has to live with William. <laughs> <laughs> my church loves Pastor. But my church don't want to know William. I wish I had somebody. Amen. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's, it's, a, very, it's a projection that we give the folk. And that's what we have to have. So authentic Christianity, authentic relationship with God is home. Yeah. When God established a relationship with man, he established a relationship with man in the context of home. And what we call that in Genesis, to go back to Genesis, we call that creative design. So here's the problem that you have to understand. You can never define purpose if you didn't make yourself. See, purpose is in the mind of the whoever created you. We all the time, I'm trying to find my purpose. I'm trying to, no, no, you can't find your purpose because you didn't make you. Whoever made you to find the side, the purpose of you. Do you understand that? See, a cup don't know its purpose. Only the maker of the cup knows the purpose. 
A car doesn't know its purpose. The maker of the car knows the purpose of that automobile. So if we want to understand purpose, we got to understand what was in the mind of God when he created us. What was in the mind of God when he created us? And you got to start with me because, see, family would never work if you don't understand your creative design as an individual. See, as a man, when God created Adam, what did he create him for? He created him to be in his image and in his likeness. He said, I don't know what should be in my image and be in my likeness. When God created Adam, watch this now, he blew himself into him. He did not blow himself into him for Adam to exist. He could have spoken him into existence. He blew himself into him so he could have a relationship with him. He blew himself into Adam so Adam could be the visible representation of the invisible God. That's what image, image is something you see. So Adam, I'm gonna put myself in you so that folk can see me. The reason why the second Adam sent us the Holy Ghost because he sent us the Holy Ghost to do what the first Adam was supposed to have done is to be the image and the representation of God. He did not send the Holy Ghost in you for you to be running around and jumping around in the church. He sent the Holy Ghost in you so you could be the visible manifestation of himself. The word witness in the Bible means evidence. The Holy Ghost is in us to give evidence of the God that's living on the inside of us. And if you wonder why people don't go to church, they don't go to church because you're not a good preacher or you're not a good teacher. They don't go to church because they work with your members and they live next door to your members and they don't see the evidence. Mm -hmm. So it's not that people don't like what they hear, folk don't like what they see. Even, even, when, even when you raise children, you don't raise children by what you tell them. You don't think why you don't raise kids by what you tell them because they don't hear you to any kind of you. Children don't hear you do that. When they get to be about 16, they don't think you even know what you're talking about. When they go to school and get a college education, they know you don't know what you're talking about. When they get to be about 35 or 40, they say, maybe you might know a little something. When they get to be 40 and 50, the older we get, then the smaller our parents were. And we walk around to my like my daddy used to say it, like my mama used to say it. You hear old people say stuff like that. Because you don't get to hear them until you become them. Yeah. So the number one thing in order to get the world screwed up together, we gotta get men into the creative design. They gotta get into the design of God. The image of God, they got to be the representation of the invisible God. So they're able to tell their families, if you want to know what God looks like, look at me. Amen? You know what the likeness of God means? It means that you're going to carry out God's agenda in your home. So whatever you're going to be doing is like God is doing that. Because you are the human representation of God. See, we're not in the world to serve God. God is not desperate. He said, if I was hungry, I wouldn't even tell you. We're in the world for God to work through us. See, we have nothing really to give him if he owes everything. See, so God said, will you allow me to work through you? In other words, it's not your agenda that's important. It's his agenda that's important. And so that's why most men are not saved. They're not saved because, see, can the folk look at you and see a visible representation of him? We don't have many men like uh, Abraham, right? When Sarah, or Abraham, such a had such a ministry to Sarah that Sarah called him Lord. We don't have many men like that. We don't have many men like that, amen? And you don't have many men, you know, and to be able to say, how many of you are really saying, are you practicing your faith in your home? Is God the Lord of your house? Is this agenda? So we are taking care of physical things, but we're not handling spiritual responsibilities. So we've allowed ourselves to get in the social garbage of this world and forget our spiritual responsibilities to God. Mm -hmm. I shared this with the brothers, you know, the purpose of, of, of getting saved is not to go to heaven, because that all would have been handled by Jesus. The purpose of getting saved is to bring heaven down to earth. And a few years ago, man, I was in my hotel in New Orleans, I was doing a conference, and they had someone on the TV called the Preview Channel. And, you know, the Preview Channel never showed you the movie. 
and just show you an excerpt of the movie. But they'll take about two minutes and make that movie so interesting that you'll stay up a couple of hours and tune into the real thing. That's what we are in the world. See, we're not the real thing. We're just the preview channel. And what we're supposed to do is to make it so interesting that folk will want to tune in and get to know the real thing. See, and this is what is missing in us. Missing us. Missing us. Therefore, you know what this church is? This church is whatever you are at home. Because your relationship with God is home. It's a relationship you bring to the church. See, that, that's why I don't deal with church issues, with people issues in church, because I know your issues didn't originate at church. <laughs> folk, folk who act a fool in church is because they act a fool somewhere else, and they bring that fool to church. <laughs> Which I have for my amen. Folk ain't holy at church because they ain't holy at home. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? See, you don't make Christians at church, you make Christians at home. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. You make hypocrites at church. Yeah. But you make Christians at home. Yeah. Amen. And so the whole concept of understanding the way family is because God has something divine in mind when he created the family. He created the family as something. It was to perpetuate his name, his image, his agenda all over the earth. That's why he told Adam to have dominion. He didn't give him ownership. He gave him dominion. I want you to manage the affairs of God under the authority of God. Amen? Amen. You see, everything we get in, everything we're, we're under kingdom. See, all of us, we're in the kingdom of God. Yeah. And the kingdom of God means that, that there's no legislation in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. okay. wow. There's no senate in the kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. There's no congress in the kingdom. Uh -huh. Nobody votes in the kingdom. Uh -huh. See, in the kingdom, whatever the king says is law. Amen. And everything in the kingdom is owned by the king. Yeah. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? Amen. And so since he made Adam in his image and made Adam in his likeness, he had to show Adam what it's like to be him, so he made gave Adam his own kingdom. Adam's kingdom is his family. Yeah. Right. It's his family. Because everything in the family is something to him, because everything in the family come out of him. Yeah. See, men are the foundation of human creation. Why? Because everything human came from men. The woman came from the man. Women are not independent. You can't be independent because you were not created independent. You were created out of. So God created you out of. That's why you call a woke man. Woke man. You are a man with a woman. You don't believe that? You don't believe that? You don't believe that? Get a hysterectomy and don't take no estrogen. <laughs> See, more stuff start drying up. Force start changing on you. <laughs> you were not created independent, man. You were not created independent. You were created out of him. You agree that out of him, you are a woe man. You are a woe man. Amen? That's why no woman has a name. No woman in here has a name. Every woman in here is named after some man. You either name after your father, you keep your father's name, till he transfer you to another man, and there's a transfer of names. Which means there's a transfer of responsibility. There's a transfer of accountability. Because yeah. whatever your name is on, amen, right. has ownership of you. Yes. Top, top you put my name on the check, I got ownership of that check. Yeah. Uh -oh. Amen? Yeah. When God created a woman and gave the woman to Adam, guess what? Watch this now. When he gave the woman to Adam, look how God did that. He named Adam, Adam named Eve. Because Eve is to be subject to Adam. Yeah. Women are subject to men. Why? Because you came out of the man. Uh -huh. And all when God puts you together in marriage, he just brings Adam back what Adam lost. He brought back the missing part of himself. Yeah. Right. A woman is a man's completion. Mm -hmm. See? And that's why he told a woman to be the help me 
It actually in the Greek, in the Hebrew, that word meet is actually M-E-T-E, which means it's to help him meet out or carry out the goals that God has for him. Because he can never do that without you. Amen. And that's the way it is. This is, this is the way it is. This is like our creative design. Creative design. This is the way God created it to be, and we're not teaching that. See, we're not teaching that. We're so caught up in the sociological structure, and God said, I told y'all, if I don't build a house, the day that labor is going to labor how? It's going to labor in vain. <laughs> And as a result of that, God created the institution of marriage, and there's no institution that's failed more than marriage in this country. And the reason why it's failed, because it's never been tried, because none of y'all have been saved enough to do it, because you got to be saved to be married. What marriage does, it uncovers the fact that you're not who you think you are. Because if you can't do family right, then guess what? Well, what are you saying about like God? What are you saying about him? Okay, I've been walking the heaven. So God created a woman, and God created the woman what? For the man. Now, when God created the woman for the man, notice there's a woman only had two responsibilities in life. The first responsibility in life of Adam and Eve is to have a proper relationship with God. That's why when God created Adam, God did not create Adam with her. He created Adam first with himself. And when God and Adam got tight and walked together in the cool of the day, then God created the woman. Now, he called the deep sleep to come upon the man, and he made the woman. But notice this, when Adam awoke from his sleep, the woman was not there. Because the scripture says that he brought her to Adam. God said if he brought her to Adam, that means he established a relationship with her. That's the same as he established a relationship with Adam. And that's why two same folk got to come together. See, marriage, marriage is not sociological, marriage is theological. You know why? It's theological because of the way you get married. Marriage is saying to me, to each other, I'm going to bring to you the relationship I have with God and what God has given me for you. That's why marriage is a covenant. It's a covenant between you and God. How do you know that? Because you make a promise in marriage that no human being can make. You make an unconditional promise in marriage, and you can make an unconditional promise to conditional human beings. When you bought your house, or whatever you buy, whenever you sign a contract, so you can't make covenants with humans, you make contracts. Because in contracts, there has to be conditions set in the contract. You ain't even start paying them yet. They talk about what the late charge gonna be if you, if you don't pay by this day. And if you don't pay by this time, we gonna come get it. Because they know even though you got the money now, conditions are subject to change. Because you are a conditional person. Amen? So you can only enter into a contract with a human being. And the way some of y'all live, that's the way you live anyhow. It's a if, if I will, if you will. That's a contract. I treat you right if you treat me right. I'll be a good wife, but you got to be a good husband. But that's not the way you get married. Married is a covenant. Because when you enter into the covenant, you just say, I do. Nobody in here got married saying, I will, if you will. Premarital counseling is to help you to understand the promise you're making to God and the representation of God that you promise to bring to another individual's life. See, the purpose of marriage is not happiness. The purpose of marriage is holiness. Why? Because happiness is a benefit of holiness. The reason why you ain't happy, because you're not holy. Oh, <laughs> Happiness is to your spirit like pain is to your body. Yeah. The reason why you have pain in your body is to let you know that something in your body is not right. Yeah. The reason why you're unhappy in your spirit is because something between you and God is not right. Oh, 
see, in order for you to be happy on, on earth, is that God has to be happy in heaven. So when you make God happy in heaven, you experience happiness on earth. So if you're miserable on earth, it's because something wrong between you and God in heaven. And you need to get heaven right so you can enjoy earthly benefits. That's why when you pray, that's why when you pray, you said, Our Father, who art in heaven, and hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come out on earth as is done where? In heaven. So everything is about making heaven happen. Everything is about making heaven happen. And so this is the thing when you come to this institution of marriage is why it's not working. It's not working because saved folk ain't doing it. Because how can you say God is favored? Let me get another powerful scripture. In Matthew 19, Jesus talked about marriage, man. And he dealt with marriage. And the first thing he did, he qualified who to get married. He says, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth, right? Yeah. But in the beginning, God made the moon, male and female. That's it. The only people who qualify to be married to carry out a divine purpose is male and female. I don't care what the Supreme Court says. It's male and female. Jesus said male and female. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. There ain't no such thing as an alternative family. What do you mean an alternative family? There ain't no alternative God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Ain't nobody know what I'm talking about. He said, I'm the Lord. I don't change. I don't even change. It's still male and what? Female. That's the way it is. I did a conference, man. A few years ago, I did a conference and I, and, uh, Walked out, man. It was a lot of homosexuals out there. They were holding hands and all this kind of stuff. And the guy would say, "Why can't we be a family?" I said, "Well, number one, you can't be a family because biblically you don't qualify." Jesus says you got to be male or female. But let me even go even deeper. Why you can't be a family? He says, "Why is that?" Because you can't carry the first order of family. And the first order of family is to be fruitful and motherly. <laughs> And two women can't bear fruit. And two men can't bear fruit. And you know what Jesus did to a tree that didn't bear fruit? Uh, he cursed that and that thing died. So the issue, but here's the thing, here's the, here's the most critical part. What's critical part, the Bible says, this is what really makes us ashamed as a church. Because everything else we're doing in this church can be counterfeit. So the enemy making counterfeit preaching, the enemy making counterfeit singing, the enemy making counterfeit. Paul said there's even a counterfeit Christ. There's a counterfeit Holy Ghost. The one that Jesus talked about the wine road religion. Amen? But his he said this. He says, now what God has joined together. How many of you at the end of your marriage ceremony, the preacher said that? How many of you understood what the preacher was saying? See, the word join in the Bible means build. Because when you build something, you're joining things. You're joining blocks together. That makes up a building. So what God is saying, if I can get a man who's committed to me, have the right relationship with me, and is committed to bringing my agenda to his wife, if I can get a woman who's committed to me and wants to bring my agenda to her husband, then when those two people get together, that would be called marriage. Most of you are not married. Most of you are fornicators with a license. <laughs> because see, basically, if you want to look at it from a technical standpoint, basically a marriage license doesn't mean that you're married because I don't know how to do it in the state of Indiana, but I know how to do it in the state of Georgia. A marriage license don't mean that you're married. Yeah. It's because you get a marriage license, you ain't automatically married. Right. Is that way in Indiana? I know in Georgia what we have to do, the preacher has to sign the license. Well, yeah. And let the state know yeah. that a marriage took place. Yeah. So the state takes the word of the lying preacher who <laughs> lied on that life. <laughs> There's no marriage license.
devices in the Bible. There's no way in there. He just said, no, you must get, you must go get the uh, license. It's not in there. It's not in there. It's not in there. The, work of, the only reason why we have marriage license is so you can get the legal rights of married folk. That's all that's all about. If your marriage is what God sees. Now, I know that may sound shocking to you, but, but, but let me ask you a question. Just because folk joined your church and got baptized in your church and on your church computers, does that mean they automatically go to heaven? No. What's going to determine they're going to go? What God sees based upon his word. Because we don't live by bread alone. We live by every word that proceed out of the mouth of God. So you got to look at your marriage tonight and I said, is it according to God's word? Amen? Amen. Then you wonder why it's not working. Your marriage is a falling apart, man. And you know, here's the sad thing. R.K. Hughes wrote a book called The Disciples of a Godly Man. And he said the church makes little or no difference in the way people live. The same level of stealing, cheating, adultery, fornication, born around is just as high among church folk as it is in the world. That's a shocking statement right there. That's a shocking statement right there. And it's really, when you really look at it, it's true. Divorce rate about 65%. Really teetering close to 70% in the minority communities. It was lower years ago, but it wasn't really lower it, because you know, black folk years ago, we didn't have no money for no divorce. We got mad, mad we just quit. <laughs> you didn't never know who your people really were. I was calling Uncle JB, Uncle JB for years until I found out his wife lived wrong time. We're not doing a good job of marriage either. 86% no. of the people who are married in this country today are not happy. 86. I know some of that's nothing God built. 86. You know, leading cause of divorce in this country, psychologists are sitting counselors trying to figure out stuff. Leading cause of divorce in this country is still communication. Communication is a bad thing because communication is not what you're saying. Communication is what the other person receives. Communication is the process of sending and receiving messages. Just because you send it don't mean I received it the way you said In fact, talking is a very small part of communicating. Only 8% of what you say you communicate. 37% has to do with the tone of your voice. You can say the right thing, but if you say it in the wrong tone, you're going to communicate a different message. If I come to your house, it's all oh, is you. <laughs> Come on in. You are coming. I mean, you said the right words. But that tone you said it in. I wish I had the right amen. I'll hold on that more, y'all. 55% of communication has to do with what we call symbolic communication. Symbolic amen. communication. We can we communicate by either things we do or things that we don't do. Or we communicate to people by facial expression. You don't have to communicate with folks. Just look at them and say, <laughs> You can look at somebody and say, You better not bother me. Yeah. Hey, Amen. My daddy gave me that look. My daddy used to say this. He said, I'm going to tell you something, boy. He said, I'm going to count to 10. If you ain't out of my face, by the time I get to 10, he said, I'm going to knock you out. And he'll start off with nine. It's amazing, man. It's just amazing. And so communication is a big thing right now. Communication. Second leading cause of war in this country is finance. Finance. In fact, 89% of all marital discord is financial. 
51% of all divorces in this country now are financial. We're going to get a little deeper tomorrow on that, why this is the issue in marriages, but, but financial is a very good. Let me tell you something, man. Finance won't give romance much of a chance. <laughs> That's why sex is the third leading cause of divorce in this country. So you got communication, on one hand you got you got finance, number two, and you got sex, number three. That's what psychologists are saying, it's called a divorce. But that's not the theological reason for a divorce. Theological reason is the reason. Here's the number one reason why people really get divorced. Because 90% of the people who are married in this country are either married to the wrong person, or you are the wrong person. <laughs> the number one cause of divorce in this country among Christians is poor mixed relationships. What makes sense? Why is this an issue? This is the issue. You know what's going happen? God brought Adam his man. But listen when God did it in Genesis 2.18. Look how he did that. He says, Adam, I will make you a helper. That would be suitable for you. I will make you someone that will fit you. See, the reason why you got to let God make the selection because, see, the way the woman was created, she was created out of the man. So she was created from the inside of the man. So if the woman was created on the inside of the man, you can't look on the outside and see where your inside is. Okay? You got to trust God to bring you what's made for you. And these marriages are not working because we're trying to make something fit that don't fit you. Why do you think a lot of people have an affair? They have an affair. He got them on at home. Nobody have an affair. Because he's with someone that's not really his. So he's looking for what's missing in her and somebody else. Poor make solution. Poor make solution. And it's in another part of that is, is that we don't understand the value of celibacy. Now listen. When God created the woman and the man, he only created them to have one relationship, husband, wife. God did not create Adam and Gal. He didn't create a girlfriend. He didn't create, he didn't create the woman, the sugar daddy, you know, my boo, my boy. All that kind of stuff, you know. I didn't, I didn't allow my daughters to date. I didn't allow my daughters to date. And one of the reasons why I did not allow them to date, and I said, I have no matter to have a problem with the opposite sex, but everything you do with the opposite sex has got to be chaperoned. Because my responsibility as a husband is to make sure that I present my daughter to another man and virgin. Because I want her to understand, number one, the only reason why a woman needs a man because of, her, of the calling that God placed upon your life. So if you're a single person, God uses your sex drive to determine the calling he's placed upon your life. Mm -hmm. See, you can only be single as you can be celibate. The single life is a celibate life. If you can't be celibate, then you have a calling of marriage on your life. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. Make sense? Amen? Yeah. And so therefore, I mean, in my, my wife asks me questions like this all the time. Well, honey, honey, how long will you wait if I die before you start dating. <laughs> I said, why are you asking me a question like that? It ain't like you're going to be around. <laughs> Don't you worry about that. possibility that I ain't gonna marry nobody. Hey, man, because I won't know what to do with him if I marry him. <laughs> but don't die today. <laughs> because I don't have the guilt. I don't have, I don't have the guilt of celibacy. So there will be another one up again. See, I don't like talking to you.
个，好了，走。So I forgot to bring you a picture. Yeah. Not very happy, man. My daughter got married. She got married a uh, uh, professed person. She professed person. <laughs> oh, you would never know what folk doing now. <laughs> I'm just saying that's what she told me. <laughs> and I wouldn't put it past because I lied to my daddy too. <laughs> And the Lord blessed them with a man who was a virgin. So hopefully he got married with a virgin. You know what God wants you, want you to be sitting? I told us, honey, if you're not ready to get mad, what you need a man for? See? Because let me tell you something. People that are in love go going to want to make love. If you're a real man and you're a real woman. If you're in love, you don't want to make them. Okay? And that's why from a biblical standpoint, when a man pursued a woman, he, he pursued her. Don't listen to this other crowd. You run after a man, you'll get somebody who will play with you, but he won't stay with you. <laughs> the Bible says he can find his wife, find her. Amen? Amen? So, so he pursues you. Once a man pursues you, watch this now. The love that a woman has for a man is a response to the love he gives to her. That's why you never tell a man you love him first. Your love is to be a response to his love. He brings his love first, and you respond to that love. See, 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 Jesus was a perfect example. Amen. We didn't have to go to heaven to meet him. He came where we were. And then guess what? You know why we love him? Because he first love us. And the love we give to him is a response to the love that he gives to us. So a woman waits, she waits, amen, until he says, I love you. And she sees the evidence of that love. Now, once she responds to that love and says, I love you too, at that moment, the next step is marriage. You know why? Because love is a commitment, and you got to do that love based upon Scripture. Scripture says in 1 John 3, 18, that love should never be just in word. Love should never be just in tongue. It should be in deed and in truth. So at the point you say, I love you, I've made a commitment to you, and that's something I want to do for you. God has given me an assignment for your life. I got some God has given me for you. When you tell a man you love him, you're telling him, I have something that God has given me to bring to your life. I have a ministry that God has assigned to me for your life. And I got right to know what you're going to bring to the table when we get together. I know this is what God has given me to make sure I can bless your life. I want to know how you plan to bless me. And see, at that moment, they would separate. And the woman would stay with her, uh, her parents. They would separate from each other. And what the man would do, the, 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 the father of the bride would then set the parameters by which he would release her to him. Because you remember, she don't have a name. So no woman can't get married until a man releases you to another man. Because marriage is an exchange of families. You're leaving one family and being released into another family. That's why your name changed. Because family is determined by name. Does this make any sense? Okay, now watch this now. Watch this now. And so what happened is they would, they would leave each other. So when they decide to get married, who decides who gets married? The man does, because the man can only marry you when he's met the requirements of the father in, in 
order for her to be released to him. And in Jewish culture, you know, he had to have his own house. In Jewish culture, he had to have some time of uh, six months or a year worth of wages in the bank. In Jewish culture, he had to have all that. And when he got all that together, she never knew when he was coming. She never knew it because marriages were never meant to be in church. You church, didn't bring marriage to temples. And thought, temples is about God. Marriage is a social arrangement basically between community. It's the impact community. It's the testimony you give for the community. That's what marriage is all about. Marriage is to change the neighborhood. Yes, sir. It's to be the ongoing witness of God in your neighborhood. And so, therefore, it, it was a house to house thing. Amen. And when the groom got ready, normally about 12 o'clock at night, by midnight, he would get ready and have his entourage with him. Amen? Yeah. And they have their torches yeah. and stuff. And then they have a, 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 a young man would run with a bell ringing throughout the neighborhood and said, the bridegroom is coming. The bridegroom is coming. The bride already got her stuff packed. She's already ready. Because she don't never know when that, when that groom is going to show up. Amen? And people come out their houses, man. And then he got his boys with him. We call them groom. Them. But those boys were there to move her from the daddy's house to the new house. She had never been in that house before because a woman who goes to a man's house and she's not married to him is a holler. She was considered a holler and so therefore women, didn't show, she didn't know what he fixed up for her. She didn't know what it was and when they got to the house, they didn't perform the marriage ceremony and guess where the honeymoon was? The honeymoon was in the house that he made for her and they would put a sign on the door honeymoon in progress and they would shut that door for seven whole days, and she would be back right there with him, celebrating in the house. Nobody knocked on the door, nobody bothered to know. And then after the honeymoon was over, they'd come out and have a seven day reception, and the whole community would be part of it and having a good time. That's the way marriage was set up. And believe me, that's the way Jesus set it up with us. He stepped out to 42 generations, lived in the womb of a virgin. Once the streets of Palestine courted us for three and a half years, got us to fall in love with him. And what the next thing he said, I gotta leave you now. Jesus, where are you going? I'm going to prepare a place for you. He said, and when I get the place ready, I'm gonna come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, that's where you're going to be. And one of these old days, he's gonna come back. He's going to come in with his grooms, and the Lord should descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and they're going to provide an escort to bring us to earth and get us into heaven and be with the Lord, and we're going to go to heaven, get married to him, live in daddy's house, and while they're going through the tribulation, we'll be going through a seven-year honeymoon. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? That's the way I'm saying That's the way God said. It's all that there. The concept of marriage and what marriage and family is really not about. I mean, women, when you get married, when you get married, watch this time, there's a transfer of families. That's why the preacher asks, who gave you this woman to be married to this woman? You can't walk down there with your daughter and give your daughter away. You belong to somebody else yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't got a husband, you need to designate an uncle or a brother or someone. But a male have to do that. A male have to do that. Then once you get married, there's a transfer of names, meaning there's a transfer of responsibility for you. That's why Christians don't hyphenate their name. See, when you get married, you can't keep your maiden name. Because you're no longer a member of that family. See what I'm saying? Because once the names transfer, the responsibility transfer. My wife was a, a probate court clerk. We had this issue when we got married. She was talking about, well, I want to keep Irving because everybody down in the courthouse know me as Irving. Everybody down in the courthouse know you got married to me. <laughs> Everybody in the corner, I was at your wedding. <laughs> well, I want to be Irving Dash Blunt. So, oh, no. Because, <laughs> see, yeah, but you can't, you, this, you can't take me from my family. So, let me explain something to you. See, when you get
get married, get ready. I'm your family. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Your mama and daddy are your relatives. Yeah. <laughs> They're your kid folk. Because <laughs> family is where you live at. Yeah. Family is who take care of you. Yeah. Family where you're nurturing. Ain't no children gonna be named Urban that's blood. Yeah. It's the blood family. Amen. Yeah. Hey it's the blood family. That's what we're doing. Oh, no, 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 no. She kept fussing us. I'll tell you what. What if I can fix it when you can keep Urban next week? Will you be happy? She said, can you do that? I said, sure. sure. Because see, if it's if it's blood dash poop, if we admit it, blood dash poop, what does that mean? It's a partnership between me. And you. Okay. So if you're going to be urban dash blunt, then the responsibility for you is now a partnership between me and your dad. <laughs> so let me call him and make sure he agreed to the terms of the partnership. So I called him up. I said, look, you, you, would you mind your daughter keep your maiden name and she just want to be urban? That's wrong. He said, no, I ain't got no problem. That's a whole lot of men. You know what that means, don't you? Yeah. He said, what do you mean? I said, he said, what you're telling me now, the responsibility for her is going to be a shared responsibility between me and you. So every time she asks me for anything, 50% of that is going to come from me. So I want 50% of the house payment. I want 50% of the life payment. I want 50%. He said, no, I ain't willing to pay all that. Then I said, take your name off it. He said, put it on the phone. <laughs> I want y'all to know to today, he just signed for the blood. The urban said, he ain't rolling up that blood. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to hold you long. Let me give you five inches up the whole time. Amen. And tomorrow we're going to let people in the married life. You know, but there, there are five H's of everybody home. If you want your home to go, five H's you have to have to operate your home. This is the first thing. You got to understand that your home is going to work, that the Bible is the health of the home. What makes your home healthy is applying the Word of God to your family. Had a beautiful lunch today with Dr. Poole and, 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 and Dr. White, and we all sit around. Lying, I really just laughed up something, and then we got serious, and we did a little preaching, the teaching, the laughing. But here's the thing I'm trying to get them to understand: is that God was not going to bless you personally. God blesses systems. The system is designed to bless you. The reason why your life is not being blessed is because you operate with a system. That's outside of what God has designed. You know what the, the definition of the world is? It's a system of operation that's outside of the Word of God. That's the world. You know why God ain't blessing these churches? He's not going to bless them because the system by which you operate is outside of the Word of God. Homes are not working because of the system. And God ain't going to bless anything that's outside of the system by which he says that. Amen? Everything functions that way. You know, if you try to take a fish and put him in, uh, put him in a tree, how long would that fish last? No, no. Because he's outside of the system by which God created for him to survive. So you, so you can't make it that way. you got to make sure you got to always check out the system. And see, is this a system that God's blessing? The blessings of God come with obedience. Sanctification is obedience. It's not emotions. You are sanctified when you obey God. See? So it's a system here. So the health of your home is going to depend on the system you operate in. First four commandments, the Ten Commandments in the Bible were, were not written to be put in buildings and churches. The Ten Commandments in the Bible 
but ten rules by which you run your house. Those were whole rules. The whole rules. And one of the rules that he had in there, he said, I should not take the name of the Lord God God in vain. We think that's cursing. That is not cursing. That's called corrupt communication. You're in Ephesians now. When you gave the word name in the Bible means authority. If my people are the ones who are called by my name, if my people are the ones who operate under my authority, there is no other name. There is no other authority by which men might be saved except the authority of Jesus Christ. God has exalted him and given him another name which is above every name. That's authority. So, so what happened is what makes you say is whose authority are you operating under? And you're going to go around and shout in church and act like you love the Lord. I love the Lord. But God says, I have no authority in your house. So if I'm there, you operate like I'm not even there. I wish I had somebody, man. The Bible said in all your ways, acknowledge him. And he would do what? You know what direct means? You don't have a clue where God's taking you until he shows you. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. So whose authority? Ask the question. Who's running your life? Who's calling the shots in your life? Who can you hold responsible for your actions? Who can you hold responsible for your decisions? How do you decide where you're working at? How do you even decide what car you ride in? See, it ain't, it ain't holy if God don't give it to you. When God don't give it to you. And so what happened is, the authority of God is not recognized in our homes. And that's why we divorce. Why? Because divorce, because marriages are based on selfishness. Everybody selfish, and selfishness is the number one killer of relationship. It's dead true. It's dead true. And so here it is. It's not healthy. Because anything that does not function the way it's designed to function is in dysfunction. And what we got happening is dysfunctional houses producing dysfunctional houses, and dysfunctional houses producing dysfunctional houses, and dysfunctional houses producing dysfunctional houses. And it goes from generation to generation to generation. Who's governing your marriage? It's amazing how many people, man, want to go buy books on 45 ways to make your husband right, right? Six, six ways to get your wife in line. 37 ways to get your man lined up. But you won't even read Ephesians 5. Why? <laughs> <laughs> really, really, you want to be serious about it? When God married Adam and Eve, he only gave them one verse. He said, look, hey, hey for this reason. A man should leave his mother and his father, should cleave to his wife, and the two shall be what? One flesh. That's it. God was done with it. He gave no more marital instructions after that one statement. No more. Amen? No more. It, it, it basically, what, this is what he said. This is what he said. You ever notice when he gave that instructions to the man? To Adam? He never once mentioned a woman. He said, therefore, a man should leave his mother and his father, and a man should cleave to his wife. Then the two shall be one. Now, one instruction he gave to the woman. Let me tell you why. Because God created you to be able to relate to him. So when God made her, he didn't give her to him because he made her out of something that he knew that he no longer had and he could not relate to. So God made sure that she was connected to him. So when he brought her to him, he instructed him, 
Don't try to figure her out because she got what you don't have and you ain't going to be able to figure her out without making yourself crazy. But the best thing for you to do to get along with her is just imitate me. Because see, I have programmed her to recognize me. And so when she can see me coming through you, then she going to be all right. The reason why is because we raise hell with you is because she don't see me coming through you. Because when I had her, she didn't have no problem. When I had her, she wasn't raising the hell. When I had her, she wasn't acting crazy. Amen. <laughs> That's why he tells the husband to be Christ. He didn't even tell the preacher to do that. He told the husband to be Christ. Because that's who she going to be looking for. I wish I had it. Amen. Uh, does it just make any sense? So the Bible is a helpful one. I, I promise you I'm going to be through it in a minute. The Bible is a The Bible is a helpful one. Amen. Amen. So you got to get back get to teaching the Bible, man. See? We're not living in a biblical age now. We're living in an age called humanism. Humanism is a celebration of the human mind. That's why you've got preachers and stuff, man, want to put all these titles and degrees on their name. Reverend Dr. Archbishop, LFD, TTT, Lady Bishop. And so they preach from their mind. They preach from their thinking. And they use the Bible as a reference and not a guide. The Bible has to be the Bible has to be the guide. It has to be the guidebook behind everything we're doing. Because if we don't let me say something, nobody else made that better than Jesus. Nobody. Nobody else made it better. He said he thought not Robert would even be equal with God. He the same as God. But he humbled himself. Yes. And became obedient even to the death of the cross. And guess what Jesus said? I don't have an agenda. Every agenda I have is his agenda. I don't say nothing more than what my father said. I don't do nothing more than what my father tells me to do. Every man in here under Christ. Is that the agenda you bring to these women? Are you telling them what he's telling you? That's what it means by head of the wife. The husband is the head of the wife. Not the boss. Hey, boss is a woman. You get hurt. You come to the woman and say, honey, I've been with the Lord and this is what the Lord says. You come to the woman and say, hey, that's the, that's the head of the house. You come into the woman, because see, both people are committed to Christ. Both people. The husband is looking at Christ. He's trying to please Christ. The wife wants to hear from the husband what Christ is saying, because she follows Christ as she gets it through her husband. Because uh, God is not going to talk to you. He's only going to talk to him, because it's not your family. It's his family. I don't care how smart deacons are, I don't care how smart you are in church, you would never know what God wants for this church unless you hear from the preacher because the Bible said, how can you hear without the preacher? Whatever God wants this church to do, only the preacher and who's signed by God for this church is going to be able to tell you that. So as a congregation, you ask the preacher, what does the Lord say? Say, and the whole men the church on a parallel of each other. Because before there was a church, fathers were priests. Before there was a church, fathers were the prophets. See? And they told the family what God told them. And I wonder how many of us, man, have a, a biblical agenda in your home, have a Christ agenda in your home. And how many godly women are pushing your husband to say, honey, what is the Lord saying? Honey, did you talk to God? I never forget, man, when I first started pastoring. And uh, I've been making very much money. 
and I have a daughter who was autistic and a son who was developing a handicap. And I wanted him to have the best of care. It was taking almost everything I had to support my family. And then I preached in Atlanta, Georgia one year at a state conference and this big church in Atlanta was vacant. They came to me and said, man, we heard you preach. We'd like for you to be our pastor. I was only making $250 a week at that time. They offered me $85,000 a year. I was struggling trying to rent a house. They said, we're going to buy you a house. Split that. In fact, we ain't going to furnish it until your wife get here. And we'll buy the furniture, whatever she wants. I was 30 hours away from earning my doctorate degree. They said, we'll send you back to school to make sure you get your doctorate. I mean, my dream car at that time was a Lincoln Continental. Oh, I doubt But I had, a, at that time, I was driving an 85 Dodge K car. Oh, no. Remember the K car? <laughs> and I had five children. It was two of us, and it was seven people riding that K car. <laughs> Man, we looked like a jaw pink feet right there. <laughs> Forsyth, Georgia, and the guy called me, and I was teaching a little town, and uh, man, I was so excited. I said, man, God came through. I was so excited. I called my wife, said, honey, we leave in Grady I said, well, I'll just tell her about all this guy said, and then she busts my bubble. She said, have you prayed about this? What the devil pray for? I ain't asking the Lord nothing. So, but honey, you always told us don't do anything to be pressed. I got on my knees that night and the Lord didn't let me sleep all night long. He aggravated me so bad. The first question he asked me is, hey, I thought you would never preach for money. You promised me you would never preach for money. God, what are you talking about? He says, then why are you leaving the church I sent you? Is it need or is it greed? Are you going there for me or are you going there for you? And Lord, I'm tired of struggling. I'm tired, I can't pay my bills, I can't do this. I'm tired of struggling. He says, son, let me take you something. You're better off struggling with me than they ever try to prosper without me. He said, this is what you're going to do. You're going to call that guy back and you're going to tell him you're not interested. He's going to ask you to come preach. Decline it. You are not preaching that church again until I say so. 17 years later before I preached in that church. So I'm just trying to tell you, we're not running our home. See, you know, we claim we're Christians, but we're not practicing it. And you can only practice Christianity in your home. And this is what he's talking about as a man. You're not a real man until your wife says you are. Because she's the only one can validate who you are. <laughs> These folk in here don't even know you. <laughs> they know what you project, they know the image you give, but they don't really know who you are. Amen? Amen. You know what I know of a pastor? What my wife says, you're a pastor. What my wife says, you are a true man. That's the one, that's the ministry that I have to provide. You're not a godly woman until your husband rises up and calls you a blessing. And your children can call you a blessing as well. All these people outside of that is a bunch of junk. Because they don't know you. Amen. Does that make any sense? 
So the husband's ahead, bring the Christ agenda. You, your job is to bring Christ's agenda to the home. Your job is to do that. You're the head of the home. The wife, she's the heart of the home because she makes it work. She's the help. What makes any organization work is the help. Boy, if the help ain't right. I don't care how smart you are as a leader. If you ain't got the right kind of help, baby, you're the help. You're the help. You know, I, 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 a few years ago, I was invited to the Steve Harvey show. And they wanted me to talk about relationships. And so they sent me his book. And the book was, you know, how to think like a man and act like a lady. And so I, I looked over the book. And I called the producer. And I, you want me to discuss this book? She says, yes. I said, I can't do that. She says, why? I said, because the book is ungodly. She said, what do you mean by the book is ungodly? I said, the book is ungodly. <laughs> There's no scripture reference in this book, nowhere. She said, well, I dare you said it about Mr. Harvey. Mr. Harvey is a Christian. I didn't say he's one of the Christians. I said, the book is ungodly. Yeah, yeah. And the Bible forbids us to live off the advice of the counsel of the ungodly. Yeah. We live by the word and authority of God. Yeah. There's no mention of God in this Bible. There's no mention of scripture in the Bible. What am I supposed to be discussing? His approach to relationship and my approach to relationship is totally different. She said, yeah, there's a lot of truth in this book. You can admit that. I know it's not. There's a lot of facts in the book. Truth is the word of God. Because truth don't change. Facts are subject to change. Amen. Let me tell you something, man. 1971, man. I was a, I was a student at Barnes Brown College in 1971. I weighed 145 pounds. My name was William Blunt. I had an afro out to here. It's 2015. My name is still William Blunt, but you can see the facts have changed. <laughs> See what makes a good man. I'm telling you something. That's why those of you who sing or don't, don't know what these dating sites are waste your time. Yeah. You know, I know what dating sites are. I think they got a, a dating site called Christian Mingle. Yeah. Yeah. And they contacted my office and they wanted me to be a counselor. <laughs> but, man, I don't get involved in stuff like that. No. Because I don't like the way you do that. You don't, you don't get mates like that. Because, see, when you go to E Harmony and Christian Mingle and all this stuff, they match you up based upon what they call compatibility. They try to find people that like what you like and all this kind of stuff. That sounds good, but it's biblically wrong. Yeah. Because see, when God sends you a man, he's not going to send anybody like you. Because if both of y'all the same, one of y'all ain't necessary. <laughs> so when God is ready to send you someone, He's going to send you someone the opposite of you. He's going to send you someone that got what you need that they yeah. don't have. Yeah. That's why he created the woman out of the man. Why? To create a need. Because if I don't need you, I won't relate to you. See, God ain't going to put two loud mouth folk together. That's not a good thing. He's going to put one got a big mouth and the other one will be quiet. That's the big man, because the one that's quiet can help the loud mouth and tone down, and the one that's loud can help the quiet one to speed up. I mean, <laughs> amen? Amen? If you don't know how to handle money, God is going to send you a woman that knows how to handle money. If you got a few woman and you, don't, you can't cook, God is going to send you a man that loves to cook. Amen? That's a good match. That's a good match. That's a good man. Isn't it good, man? Isn't it good? Isn't it good that when God got ready to send us a woman, he didn't send nothing looking like us? Yeah. Yeah. The only reason why we wanted you because y'all got something we ain't got. Yeah. I wish I had somebody, amen? Yeah. Uh, uh, I ain't 
ain't getting in bed with nothing got what I got.
So you mean to tell me you're going to use her as an excuse to disobey me? Amen. So now you done made her more important than me. Do you realize, let me tell you something, do you realize that God was sometimes, every relationship that God puts in your life is not by design. Some relationship are by development. God allows you to be in some relationship to develop you for to be able to have what he designed you to have. Yeah. That's why it's not been messing with folk who got failed relationship because some people need to fail to get the way they need to go. Yeah. Some people don't know how to treat a good man until you had a bad one and my boy go behind out. <laughs> next time when you get a man, you know how to treat Some of y'all couldn't do right with one. It took three of y'all to get one. It's amazing, man. It's amazing, man. You know, I just don't like I just keep one into it. I keep picking all these bad men. Remember when I just keep picking all these bad men? I said, well, that's a, it's a good reason for that. I said, she said, why? I said, because you're a bad woman. And God lets you select what you are. You are attracted to whatever you are. You are. If you attract trash in there, because trash no trash, so they are attracted to you. See? You in bad shape, man, when a homosexual look at you and call you a homosexual. Hey, man, you in bad shape. Because homosexual was no homosexual. And then some of you got to stick close to God for what you want to be in life, because see, you can either be somebody's blessing or be somebody's lesson. Some of you were never meant to ever be with nobody. God just uses you to punish somebody else. <laughs> when I really want a whooper joker, I send him to you. Amen, because you... And you that joker's lesson. Yeah, yeah, and he, he told me, I, I haven't preached in a few weeks. I think we with you about a couple of months. Hey, that's crazy. Oh, my God. <laughs> How many of y'all learned something tonight? How many of y'all learned something already? Right? Yeah, yeah. Let me get the last one. The children of the Holy Spirit are very important to understand. And the Bible tells us what we ought to be teaching my children. But the purpose of having a home is to what? Is to manufacture Christians. The home is a place where you make Christians. Yeah. Amen. The fruit of a Christian is another Christian. That's why whenever God, you ever notice this? Whenever God wanted to deal with you, he dealt with the home. When he determined who's going to be the leadership in the church, he didn't ever go to the seminary. He didn't look at resumes. He wanted to know, is he the husband of one wife? You know what that means? You see a one woman man. You'll never know how spiritual you are until you know how to be with your partner. Most marriages are not working because we don't have the right ministry of love. You know why? Because of the whoredom we commit when we're singles. And it's hard to be a whorish man and be a faithful husband. Because if you train yourself to be a whore, then one woman ain't going to do you. <laughs> I grew up in a culture where you train men to whore. We train women to be faithful. Faithful. Oh, how many more friends you got? Oh, I, I mean, I got five or six, Daddy. That boy's something. Ain't he? He's something. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. 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 So you talk, for, talk fidelity to women, but you talk harder to men. Yeah. Here's the dangerous part about that. When you love more than one woman, you don't love none of them. Because God only created you to love one. Amen? So we got to train our sons not to be whores. Amen. So it doesn't matter. It's not a matter of telling the girl when to say no. It's telling the boys, don't even ask that. Because you're supposed to be Christ. Your job is to protect her. How would Christ lead a woman in the sin? You're the woman protector. You protect her from sin. But here you are, you're going to lead her into sin. 
I think you ain't got an answer to God. It's, 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 it's a lot of critical stuff here, man. It's critical when you look at that. And you know what the danger of fornication is? The danger of fornication is that nobody would know how to live with you because they don't live with you. So sexuality and marriage is marriage in the Bible. When you commit a sexual act, you just committed a marital act. Because in sexuality, two become one. So when you have sex with someone, you have made yourself one with that individual. Now that the person that gets you don't know how to really relate to you because he ain't dealing with only you. He's dealing with everybody else you've been married to before. So he got to live, he deal with Bobby and Frank and Joe and Jeff. You know? And you know why you act crazy on him? Because when he hit a Bobby spirit, you come out of a Bobby bag. <laughs> But you know what Frank did? See, Frank told you he was going to Walmart and he'd never come back. <laughs> now you done married Joe and Joe said, baby, I'm going to go to Walmart for a minute. And, boy, you freak out. Because <laughs> God never, never intended for you to get married with a resume. Married with a resume. The greatest enemy of marriage is your past. Is your past. Amen. Is your past. Here's the last thing when they build on. The husband, the, the Bible is the help of the home, the husband is the head of the home, the wife is the home of the home, the children of the home. But the marriage is the head of the home. You see this? Uh, you tell you why we got to the God. You misrepresent his marriage. Yeah, that's why. Well. You tell what marriage is supposed to be on earth. It's supposed to be an illustration of relationships that Christ has in the church. It's an illustration. It's an illustration of husband. I want you to love your wife like Christ. Same as Christ. Husband, I want you to be the head of your wife like Christ. Wives, be subject to your husband as the church. It's subject to Christ. So when the world looks at marriage, they see the relationship that Christ has with the church. But it goes a step deeper than that. Because God is asking us to be an illustration of something on earth that has not even occurred yet. Because we don't get married to Christ if we get it until we get in heaven. So God is saying, bring a heaven relationship down to earth. So they can see an illustration of that on earth. So when they get to heaven, they can understand what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. So the marriage is the heaven of them. So imagine we we fold know what heaven is like looking at your marriage. You know why children get saved? Because they live in heaven. And who would want to go to heaven? But when they see heaven, they see it in the way dad relates to mom yeah. and really mom relates to dad. Yeah. And they sell the loan, build the house, they labor in vain. Before I even come, I'm going to talk about marriage. I'm going to talk about the four basic reasons in this country why relationships are dysfunctional. And I want each of you to look at your relationship mm -hmm. and you'll be able to see that. We're going to give you, excuse me, three of them, three basic things. And you know what? We're not working in marriages because we get married and there's unexpected differences. Let me show you how And the second reason is because I'm frustrated because of unmet needs. Because the purpose of marriage is fulfillment. And the third reason why I'm frustrated is because of unforgiven hurts. Unexpected differences, unmet needs, and unforgiven hurts. And you have to deal with all of that if you feel to And to really be successful. We're going to talk about how to win. We're going to show you how to love them. 
and put a loving on her that'll make her head spin all the way. And like she had the exorcist. And what ministry you give to that man, help that man become the man you have to be. I had a lady in the clothes on this, and the lady was telling me, she said, she husband would come home drunk. Everything. I would work with him, tore up. Sometimes he was so drunk, you know, he couldn't even find his house. You know. And she just cried and turned out so tired of that man acting like that. And then uh, a final one of the friends told us that you fuss at him so much. Yeah, No wonder the man like that. And the man told the guy at the bar, he said, Man, I gotta be drunk. I can't take that moment so I have to be drunk. So a friend told us that why don't you just be nice to him? Be kind to him and see what that be better. Because most people, and it's true, most people are reacting to you. They are. They're reacting to you. Amen. They're reacting to you. Yeah, she shot at me three times. Yeah. <laughs> what were you doing to make her shoot at you? Yeah. She, she reacted to something. Yeah. But, but what happened is, so, so when, I, when he got home that day, he was so drunk, man, he, he went to the wrong house. So she had to go get him from the wrong house. She said, baby, it's okay. She brought him home. She came to fire him down. He was too drunk to eat it, so she fed it to him. She said, you want to go upstairs? <coughs> Let me give you a nice bath. Yeah. You know, put on your pajamas and just let you relax. Yeah. And he looked at her and said, might as well. I'm going to catch hell when I get home. <laughs> God bless you, man.